have finished inking the cute little illustration that I'm using for the Sennelier La Crelle French Artiste Watercolor. We're going to be doing the field test today, so I hope you guys are looking forward to it. I have the paints in a few different ways. So, I could not find, around my home, I could not find a container that would fit my little half pans. Everything was too big or too small. I'm just gonna go buy a pack of Altoids since they're already in the half pans. And I tried to order a container. I tried to be sneaky and smart and order a container off of the internet. And this is what I ended up getting because I am bad at sizes, right? And it's not gonna work. So what I did is I put dots of the watercolor in this and I'm gonna send one to my mom and see if she can make like a wrist strap for me because I've seen those sort of like portable palettes around and I think that would be really fun to have. So hopefully I can have one of those, but I'm not using this today. I'm going to be using the half pans most likely and possibly the tubes in addition. So this was sketched on the beautiful Arches watercolor paper that Kabocha sent me. In fact, all of this was sent by Kabocha. So thank you so much, Kabocha. If you guys have not checked out her webcomic link yet, you can find a link to Tish in the description below. It is a very beautiful shoujo-esque comic. So if you like my art, I'm sure you will like Link. So she sent these two beautiful, beautiful watercolor gifties as an early birthday present. And I promised that I would get on doing the field test ASAP. So that's what we're doing today. And this was inked with the Sakura Pigma FB, which is waterproof. And we've only got five colors to play with. So I've got to get this all painted with just five colors. So this is going to be a challenge. It's going to be a little exciting and I may goof, but that's okay. We're going to learn together. So I hope you guys are as excited as I am. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to apply a wash of this cool yellow. Well, I guess it's really a mid yellow, right? That's what we found out in the unboxing swatch. It's a nice, nice mid yellow. So first things first, I actually, rather than working from the half pan, let me work from the tube. That'll make it a little easier. It'll dissolve a little quicker. Just to show you guys how nice and sizable these tubes are. Put a little dot where, somewhere I can use it. I'll put a little dot down. They used to say, just a little dab will do ya. And while I do want a, a bright yellow, I don't want it to be so intense that it's going to overwhelm everything I'm painting. And then I'll apply the first wash on this lovely cotton rag paper. There, now we have a nice all over tonal wash. I'm gonna use a bit of paper towel and just go in and lift it a little bit from her face. All right, and then we let it dry. Our next step, I'm gonna mix a little bit of blue. We'll just use the blue in the pan with this yellow and paint in some hopefully really light green leaves. I want something really fresh and vibrant. So off camera, I've got, ooh, that might be too light, but it is pretty. We'll start with this. Actually, no, that's gonna be too light. Mix in a little more blue. Grab some more yellow, you know, the way you make a green. Use some of this yellow in the half pan. Yellow in the half pan. Okay, so that is just pure blue, pure green of what was included in this set. It's a little bit muddy because we mixed a warmish blue with a coolish yellow. So those of you who may remember the Daniel Smith Essential Six Challenge, I was able to get these really lovely green blends because 
we had two yellows and two blues. So I could get some really vibrant mixes by mixing cool yellow with cool blue. I'll do a layer as an underpainting. However, we only get five colors with this set and I am gaga about the Chinese orange they included. It's a beautiful color. So I am excited for sure about that. I'm just kind of freehanding some of these leaves in here. Paint through the bee's wing, but only where it directly crosses the leaves that are gonna end up being a darker green. And I found out you can mix almost any color you want if you have the right six. So I will be curious to see if I can mix any color I want if I have the right five. And the green is actually drawing a little bit lighter. So I am happy about that. That's more the color I had in mind. Try to leave some of that open over there. Do the same down here with the bottom. I don't think there is a single time of year where I don't want to paint summery or springtimey kind of illustrations. That's just my aesthetic. That said, it is tomorrow is the first day of March for me in video time, in back time. And March means month of back because I'm born March 19th. But I guess I'll, sh I'll share with Sam because month of back, month of Kabocha, we both have birthdays in March. I'll share, but only because I like you so much as a person. And I'm already scheming what kind of goodies I can bring back from Japan to send to my art supply friend. It'll probably be like when I went to San Jose, San Francisco, where I would just buy two of everything. Anything that looked good to me, I was like, okay. But it's really nice to have like an art supply exchange buddy that you can send goodies to and send swatches to. I think I've mentioned this in a few of my watercolor videos that it's so nice to be able to send to exchange swatches because it means in order to find out whether or not I like a product, I don't have to buy every product or I don't have to buy every color. I can exchange with friends who do have those colors. Ooh, I like that. I want to do something to kind of break up this middle piece, that's already drawing. Or maybe I kind of want to leave it. <laughs> what do you guys think? Start up there, and then I'll paint in a few that kind of break up that space a little bit more. There we go. Now we almost have kind of like that moment where man and God touch, where girl and bee touch channeling Michelangelo. Yeah, I went there. I went there. I went there, y'all. All right, so I'm going to let that dry. And then we can mix up a darker green or maybe even start working on the branch she's sitting on. Okay, guys, so this is dried. I'm gonna go ahead and start in on the next layer. And I'm only gonna really focus on tightening the details on these leaves, not on the background leaves. And I guess I'll just go ahead and do that in time-lapse. And now that I have those leaves painted, I kind of want to go into the background leaves and do some of those in the same green. So what I'm going to do, or similar green, is I'm going to mix some of that blue in with the green that I'd mixed along with a little bit more yellow. Now we ought to get maybe a more watered down version of the color. And I'm just going to go in and paint some green leaves on top of my background green leaves. Now, hopefully these will be a little less saturated than the leaves in the foreground. If not, that's okay. It would save me some work, so. 
I'm just gonna do this in time lapse. Since I did that, I'm actually going to add some more of the blue, which is a nice ultramarine blue, but not always the best kind of color for these sort of things. I'm gonna add some of this nice ultramarine blue back into these leaves and use this kind of help me establish some depth. I know I don't talk about it often on here because I don't get the chance to paint on arches all that often, but it really is a pleasure. It's so nice. I could be doing a lot of wet into wet techniques with this paper because it is very absorbent and the fact that it's on a block, it's not gonna buckle. And the eight by eight format is one of my favorite formats. So this is really nice. And be careful because I've got a lot of wet areas and I'm an, an impatient person. So I'll just try to paint very carefully. Maybe, maybe, Japan might be the place. Maybe while I'm in Japan, I can find a calligrapher's mall, like an artist bridge, except for comic people, which would be about perfect for me. That is a thing to definitely be on the lookout for. Okay, I'm gonna have to work carefully on this one because this is a kind of a weird little leaf, but I think I got it. All right, I think that's gonna look really nice. I'm gonna let that dry and then I'm gonna work on the branch she's sitting on. All right, so let's begin working on this tree branch. I'm going to pour some clean water, a little bit too much clean water, but still some clean water into one of the daisy palettes. Let me pull out so you guys can actually see me mix and swatch. I have some clean white watercolor paper right there. So there's a lot of different ways you can mix browns and I'm going to move this over so I can demonstrate for you guys. One of the first ways we can mix a brown is you're just mixing two contrasting colors. In this case, we've got Chinese orange, we've got ultramarine blue, we've got Payne's gray. I'm gonna quickly do a small demonstration swatch of each, just so you guys can see. And there's lots of ways to mix grays, lots of ways to apply the color to the page even. Okay, so that, Ultramarine is a little dirty. I've been painting leaves, so. First way we're gonna mix a gray is we're gonna, I mean a brown, is we're gonna take Payne's Gray and then we're gonna apply a contrasting color. Payne's Gray is kind of a bluish gray, so we're gonna mix the gray and the brownish orange to get a decent enough brown. Then we're gonna do another method and we're mixing on paper. This is not glazing. This is just me doing wet into wet mixing on the paper. Same way you'd mix in a well and then apply. So we're taking the Chinese orange and then we're grabbing some ultramaroon and we're mixing those together. And you can get different browns by mixing different saturations. So let's grab a lot of saturated Payne's gray and a little bit of Chinese orange. Then let's grab a little bit of ultramarine blue and a lot of Chinese orange. And this is basically your road to mixing ne neutrals, including grays and browns. So you can also do it through glazing. Let's apply some Payne's gray. Let's apply some ultramarine blue and we're going to give those and then actually let's apply some Chinese yellow and that way we can kind of demonstrate how your order of operations how you apply 
your color makes a difference. So if we're gonna use a glazing technique where we allow these to dry. So I'm gonna come back to these now. Another way we can mix a brown with these colors is by mixing an orange. Let me clean out this yellow here. I was, again, painting leaves. A little bit sloppy. So we're gonna grab some yellow. grab some red to end up with kind of an orange color. Not a perfect orange, but an orange. And then we would grab some of this ultramarine blue. And actually I want a little less of that in there. Mix those together. If it looks a little like a greenish brown, you can always add some more red. Then could also do the same with our Payne's Gray. So we'll apply the Payne's Gray first. We'll apply our red. We'll apply our yellow. So, Lots of different ways to get brown. You can also just kind of mix all the colors together and then adjust, which is not necessarily the best method. So I'm gonna let these have a chance to dry and then we'll do some glazing and see how that affects the color. All right, so while these layers aren't 100% dry, they are mostly dry. So we're gonna go over with, let's grab the Chinese orange. We'll apply it over the Penny's gray. So we are doing wet over dry and we're glazing. Chinese orange over ultramarine blue. There might be some left off just because I didn't necessarily let these dry 200%. All right, Payne's gray over Chinese orange. Ultramarine blue over Chinese orange. So let's see, let's see. The, this lighter mixture of Chinese orange would darker Payne's gray is more gray than orange. This one is more of a brown. The ultramarine and the orange does not seem to make a very good brown, but the orange, the ultramarine with the red orange is, I don't know, I have such, I have, I kind of don't like that ultramarine. I like, I mean, I like it as like a paint product, but I kind of don't like it as a mixing color. It really seems like the best way to get the browns we want are using Payne's Gray as the base for this particular set. And then either red with yellow orange, traditional Crayola orange, or the Payne's Gray with orange. So we're gonna go ahead and mix up in the daisy well. Some Payne's Gray, and I need a fairly sizable amount. So I'll swatch as we go, just to check. Very light paint is going. And we're gonna grab Chinese orange. Swatch as go. Mm. I mean, that's a very, it's like a buff gray. It's a very light sort of brown. Oh, I'm actually going to, I may use all the colors except for that blue, just because I feel like that blue is throwing some weird hiccups into the mix. I don't necessarily know how to accommodate them, so I'll swatch again. All right, a little darker. That's good. That's good. Now our Chinese orange again. and a lot of mixing from a limited palette is mix and swatch, mix and swatch, mix and swatch, which is great in that, ooh, that's gonna end up being a nice brown if I can get it dark enough. A lot of mixing from a limited palette is, uh, so you, you are carrying less with you, so it is good for lightweight portability. And if you can kind of utilize a limited palette, that's really helpful. But this is why I use a nice big convenience color palette for Kara, because I would be going through so much paint mixing like this. 
and then getting the wrong color and then trying to correct. But it is fun to do this and I love being able to demonstrate it for you guys. This is why we're swatching. All right, I think that's gonna end up being a nice base brown and we did that with just Chinese orange and Payne's gray. So we've got our brown. Now it's time to apply that first layer. Ooh, it's gonna actually look really nice on this paper. We were, we were mixing on really cheap Canson, found it like the Canson bulk paper, but it's gonna look nice on this. So I'm impressed that we were able to get kind of a sepia brown from possibly just two pigments. Uh, I'd have to double check because I know of those tubes, a couple of them had two to three pigments, but it still always impresses me that, you know, <laughs> color theory always impresses me, always amazes me. I am forever left in awe at how much one can do with so little. It's like magic. I'm sure that's how people who enjoy baking feel. It's like magic. That's how I feel when I eat other people's baking. It's like magic. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of do a solid fill on this branch and then I'll kind of decide from there. I kind of want to do a tree bark pattern, but I need to see how dark this dries, especially since when I swatched it on the cheap paper, it did not swatch this nice and dark and saturated. That's like a perfect example of like nice, see, see part of the paper review. So we had a very cheap, paper, student grade. It's like a bulk watercolor paper, 90 pounds. Got it from Amazon. I paid like 20 bucks for a hundred sheets of that kind of watercolor paper versus this much nicer cotton rag paper on a block. You can hear the angels singing. Ah. Sometimes I'm not always the best at being able to demonstrate. Like, I think there's a place for cheap papers. I obviously use them. Um, and it's not just for demonstrations. I do use Montval for Kara. And sometimes I just like working on cheap paper because there's particular properties that make that cheap paper easier to work with. So, you know, I do think there is a place in this world, this wide and wonderful woolly world for cheap watercolor paper. I just also think having access and being able to occasionally use nice watercolor paper can be really transformative. It was, it has been for me, a transformative experience. because I really, you guys did not know me, but I really didn't get to improve as a watercolor artist until I had access to nicer. I started branching out and playing with nicer papers. And it's hard to convince yourself to spend that money when you've never done any, never used a nicer paper and you can't replicate the techniques you see people doing in tutorials and in vlog posts. In fact, one of my big teachers for learning watercolor was the Dick Blick YouTube channel, which has all of these really great, very easily uh, consumed, bite-sized, step-by-step watercolor demonstrations to demonstrate just one technique at a time. Um, I really enjoyed learning from their channel. So if you are still learning, I do recommend you head over there. But they didn't they didn't always disclose what paper they were working on. And I assumed it was student grade because I just assumed it was student grade <laughs> because I was a student and I don't know. And so they were able to get te achieve techniques like wet into wet blends, etc., that I just couldn't get on the papers I was using and I couldn't figure out why. And I really thought it was just, I'm terrible, 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 terrible. And then I switched papers and I was able to get some of the techniques they were talking about. So I'm gonna let this finish drying, then we're gonna check back in. All right, so I'm gonna start painting some tree bark, which means I'm gonna go hit up Google. Cause I want it to kind of look like the real deal, the actual real thing. So I'm looking up a tree branch and now I gotta decide what kind of tree branch I'm gonna paint. <laughs> I could have even done like paper bark and then gone really light and then done some darker details. And this sort of attention to detail thing is always a little hard for me. It's like I just don't have good eyes. 
And if my silliness is off-putting, I do not apologize. This is who I am. And I had a migraine all earlier today, so I had a lot of caffeine to kind of kick the migraine, help the medication do its thing. And so now I'm feeling much better and much more caffeinated. I gotta be careful here because the grain of a tree branch goes in the same direction as the tree branch, according to my Google search, according to my Google reference. So a few years ago, there was a shirt that came out that said to the Googles and I liked it so much I bought two. Mostly because the ability to Google search for things is phenomenal. It's such a resource for artists. That's like Wikipedia. I love Wikipedia so much that every year if I have money and even if I don't have money, I give what I can because to help them with their operating costs to keep information accessible because even though it's free to the public, it's not free to the hosts. And if they had a Kickstarter or a Patreon, I would definitely continue giving them my money and support. So I kind of want this color to be darker. And I kind of want to do my old, I say old like it's, like I'm not doing it anymore. But I kind of want to do my little painting hack where I let that color evaporate all evening. So what I will probably do is I will probably go clean out my water and then start working on other things and then come back to the branch a little later on when like tomorrow a little later on or like two hours from now a little later on when the colors have had a chance to evaporate from the pan and get a little more saturated in that way I don't have the burden of remixing the color and trying to make it darker without being well you guys know what I mean I need a darker tone but not a different color and that's hard that's so hard for me you guys it really is though it's like legit hard for me <laughs> something else I could do is I could move it into a smaller um, pan like a smaller amount of water or a more spread out cup wording today is hard and then it would evaporate quick. So we're going to step away, step away from the branch for a little bit. And we're gonna, we're gonna mix a skin tone. So I'm gonna do some prep. All right, so the branch is still drying, but it is dry enough that I could start working on her skin. So the next thing we need to do is mix up a skin tone. So I've got a fresh sheet of swatching paper. I've also got my ba -ba 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 -ba, my pans and I cleaned out my water. So I am going to fill another daisy well. I do you like the sound effects? I like the sound effects. With clean water. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. So usually when I mix skin tones, I start with yellow ochre and I add a little bit of scarlet or red. So for this, I'm gonna start with a little bit of the Chinese orange. Oh, do I want, I wanna test it first because I am like not 200% sure. So before I commit, I'm gonna test it by mixing it on my little Fiskars craft mat. And actually this might be close to a skin tone to begin with. Ooh, no, it's like mustard. Grab a little red. I could, maybe I need to grab a little blue. Maybe that's where we're going with this. That is a little bit better, especially if it was Yes, and I think like a smidge of blue, but that ultramarine leaves me a little nervous. So I'm just gonna do like a little bit of blue, right? And we're gonna go ahead and mix it. Oh, I think I did too much blue. <laughs> well, maybe not, we'll see. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Then we're gonna grab, let's grab, let's, let's reuse, recycle some of that Chinese orange. 
straight from the mat. Grab a little moi. And it's looking, it is looking rough, right? Like we might have to remix, which is a thing that happens. Grab a little yellow. It's a reality. Oh my gosh. Wow, that's bad. Oh yeah, that's bad. He's bad. Let's add some red. Let's just compound problems. Okay, that's actually a little better. Not really Kara skin tone, but now we kind of know how to do a darker, how to progress towards getting a darker skin tone if we wanted a darker skin tone. So what we're gonna need to do is we're gonna need to grab some yellow and some red. And then we may need to take a dropper and transfer out. Let's see. Oh, that was a little too much blue. Isn't that funny how like it's very faint blue, but it's still like, oh, that's a lot of blue. So we don't really need more red. Let's grab more yellow. I think I could do it with this. I'm like not 110% pleased with it, but I think I could do it with this. So we used a smidge, just a touch of French ultramarine a little bit of red, a little bit of yellow, and a little bit of Chinese orange in order to get a workable skin tone. And uh, normally I would just use two colors. I would use um, yellow ochre and scarlet red, but when you're working with a pre-mixed sort of sketching palette, you work with what you got. So we've got our dubious skin tone mix. Let's start applying it. Little hesitant because I'm not 110% but hopefully it won't be too bad. It's a little more olive than I normally would mix Kara's skin, but it's not as a skin tone. It's not an unusual, it's not a bad skin tone. It's a good skin tone. It's just not the correct mix for this character. So that is an area if I'm gonna do limited skin tone mixing, limited palette skin tone mixing, that's an area I can definitely stand to improve in. It's okay. Uh, Making mistakes and learning from them is a lot like eating foods you don't like, but are good for you. I don't want to say eating your vegetables because vegetables are delicious. I just want to encourage you guys to, like taking vitamins because no one would think vi taking vitamins are delicious vitamins taste gross but you know they're good for you so it's like taking your vitamins you know we got to make mistakes in order to grow so i wanted to blend want to not just wanted i want to blend out these 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 pink these skin tones a little bit having a little trouble because I'm using a squirrel brush, which is very soft, which means once I create a thirsty brush with it, it basically loses all its structure. Maybe I should dual wield and use another brush to add clean water and do the blending. The blending. Which it did request a bad French accent, so I do need to work a bad French access and accent into this. And by that I mean a poorly done French accent. Not that French accents are bad, are bad to have. Simply a poorly done one. So you know, some Lumiere and some Pepe Le Pew and some probably cringe. Ideally, I would have a good French accent, like well done and well studied because I have taken, let's see, gosh, three, dem- three semesters in college plus two full years in high school plus two years in middle school, full years, plus from fourth to sixth grade. So I've taken, I've taken a lot of French. I grew up in, as you guys know, I grew up in Louisiana and uh, some of the older members of my family even spoke a little bit of French, not enough to be bilingual, but like they'd grown up in families where the older people spoke French 
but they were very strongly discouraged from speaking French in school. And the schools encouraged them not to speak French at home also because English was what we were pushing. So, you know, a lot of that has gotten kind of lost. All right, skin tone, first level done. Let it dry. Layer one has dried. Time for layer two. It's actually a little bit better than I thought too. So switching out to a Kalinsky brush, something that isn't so flappy. And I think, oh, is that blue starting to show through? One of the problems with some paints that use natural pigments is they will settle at different rates. So not only do you have to restir them often, which isn't the biggest end of the world, but sometimes they'll settle out and look really weird. And that is one of the things that the ultramarine has already kind of shown me it's gonna do, shown me its moves. Which is it's a little frustrating. And I'm kind of thinking the skin tone should be allowed to evaporate a little, but I'm a little nervous to do that because if the ultramarine is going to be a pill, then just adding it at all is going to be a problem. So I'm also going to have to figure out how I want to handle the shading on her. I may. So um, a couple years ago, I did a bunch of of small figure studies from reference. In fact, you can find one of the process or time-lapse videos here on this channel. And I found that although I use for my illustrations, I will use a red violet to shade skin for the most part. Um, in reality, shadows are more of a Payne's gray than they are a red, red violet. So since I already have a Payne's gray, I may go with that, especially since this blue, the ultramarine blue is just a little it's more than a little. It's pretty weird. It's weird. So we're going to let this dry. So her skin has had a chance to dry. These are not part of this video. I'm going to grab a little bitty beat, a teeny tiny beat. I have a really hard time just grabbing a little bitty beat of alt ultramarine. It's like impossible for me, but I'm going to grab as little as I can. And I'm going to do the shadow on her eyes and then blend it out. And then I know I want these flowers to be white. So I'm gonna do a shadow on them. And I kind of saw her wearing like a yellow and white dress. I'm kind of leaning to making that like a red and yellow dress, but I'm afraid it's gonna look ketchup and mustard. Maybe I'll give her red shoes. Red shoes are really cute. Um, mostly because I want to integrate every color I can. We're going to go ahead though and mix up kind of a straw color for her hat. So I'm going to grab some Chinese orange, which I really love this color and some of this yellow, which I don't love as much and a little bit of gray because I want it to have a brown aspect to it. And plus, it'll help desaturate. And I'm also a little afraid of that ultramarine. Okay, so we've got pretty close yellow ochre. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to leave a little bit of rim lighting. I'm going to, there we go, get a little bit of straw. having a lot of fun painting this by the way. I'm gonna leave some more rim lighting because this is my jam. It's cute. That's a cute look. And then we're gonna start I think with her shoes. I'm just gonna grab a little bit of red. Little bit. And we're gonna do kind of an underlayer. And that way we can make her have shiny red shoes which was like my heart's one true desire and my mom could not find them in my size but i really wanted shiny red shoes i really 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 wanted glitter red shoes like dorothy from the wizard of oz and even as an adult i really really want glitter red shoes and i don't care if that's not in style anymore i want them 
So I'm thinking about it. I am going to have a beast of a time painting Kara's hair because Kara has a very specific hair color. Also just noticed an area that should have been colored last night. So I'm going to grab, because I still have that green. I'm try to water it down a little bit because I don't want it to like stick out too much. It's going to stick out a little bit. Probably not too much though. And now I'm going to start on kind of a base layer for the bees. So to my old friend, the Googles, we will go. And bees are definitely going to use some of this color, but they're also going to use a little bit of yellow. I'm going to start by just doing kind of like a, an overall under color of the yellow. Cause you can always go darker, but you can't always go lighter. Right. Let's see, their wings are like kind of a translucent brown color. So I'm not gonna paint them yellow. I'm gonna use the same color I mixed for Kara's hat, a little watered down. I will admit I'm a little bit afraid of bees, but I also think they're very cute. And I will go out of my way to avoid hurting them and give them lots of space and not scare them. Cause I know they don't wanna hurt me. So I don't wanna hurt them. But I like bees. I just am a little afraid of them. Oh, it's coming along. I like it. I'm trying to work a little slow so that I use the right colors. Get everything the way I have it in my head, which is nice because sometimes I will work too fast. So having to stop and slow down, mix the colors, think about how I want to mix the colors. Uh, if you find yourself painting too quick and maybe making like sloppy choices, which I have, am guilty of, I think moving to a smaller palette would actually be beneficial because then you have to slow down and think about what you're doing a little bit, just, just in order to get the colors you want. And then once you master mixing your colors, you kind of want to make the top button, oh, I need to think about that dress more before I make a decision. I also need to think about the flower. I kind of want the flower to be blue, right? Because there isn't going to be a lot of blue in this piece, but you know what? I'll let it dry. I'll think about it. I'll figure it out. All right, everything's had a couple minutes to dry. I'm gonna go pull up my base and get those finished because I actually want to use the base color from the hat for the next shade on the hat. So we're gonna do the bees first. Basically, basically. We wanna leave um, kinda like a halo-y color. And don't worry, I'm gonna add the black stripes, the bee stripes. I know what a bee looks like. I know what the buzz is. And I also wanted to use a lighter version of that color for the wings. There we go. Goodness. Now I'm gonna grab, I'm gonna grab a little, a little bitty bit, a little bit of the paint gray and I'm gonna put it in. I hate to do that because it was a really nice color and now it's gonna be less nice. Actually, I could grab a little bit of that brown we mixed, hopefully not too much, and use that. Oh, okay. Yes, this will work. All right, so this has had a little minute to dry. And I think it's probably time that I plunge on in and get started on the dress. So I think for the base color of the dress, I'm gonna go with a lighter yellow. And then for her sash, I'm gonna go for a darker yellow, uh, maybe even a yellow orange. And that way, you can kinda get a variety of color. So I have watered this yellow down significantly. It's a very bright yellow, very uh, prominent yellow even. 
assertive. Assertive is the word I'm looking for. It's a very assertive yellow, which mm, I, I, it kind of makes sense considering this is a, a kind of a test set, a blending set even. It's also like I, I kind of vacillate between thinking it's a warm yellow and a cool yellow. The more it's watered down, the cooler it feels. Um, when it's slightly more saturated, it feels warmer. You know, I just hold my hands up against it and feel the radiant heat. Just I eyeball it. I guess it with my eyeballs. It is a very cheerful color. I'm still deciding what color I want to make the bow in her hair. I kind of wanted to match her shoes so that they're not like the only red thing she's wearing. But then the outfit feels a little less coordinated. Maybe I should do, well, you know what? We'll do it one step at a time. So for right now, we're doing her dress. I'm also going to pull up my bzz, 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 honeybee reference and I'm going to start, I could start with Payne's Gray, but I'm actually going to start with that brown we mixed for the, the branch. I think that's going to be a better, it's a better bee base. All your base, bee base, base. Bulbs long to us. That's why I can build up the color very nicely. And then we'll come over here and do this little buzz, buzzer bee. Bzz, 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 bzz. Actually, I will blend this out a bit since we've got a transparent wing on top of it. I kind of want to you know, play with color depth, even if it's just kind of an optical illusion. So since I want her collar to be white and I want the ribbon that's all, like down here, I want that to, it's going to be gingham. So that means I need to do white and yellow. The first thing I'm going to do, and I'm so hesitant to do this because I have such mixed feelings about this ultramarine blue, and I've been having a really hard time controlling it, is I'm going to go ahead and shade it first because I find it's easier when working with super light colors like yellow to do your shadows first and then do your main, your tone color, your, your body color. So that turned out okay so far. Now to do her collar. Now I'm going to grab some Payne's Gray and put some paint on these bees. I'm not so sure if this is intended to be a mixing palette like the Daniel Smith Essential 6 or if this is intended to be like a testing palette like here are some of our favorite colors. We think you will like these the best. They're not necessarily intended to be used together but I'm gonna make it work. I'll figure it out. We'll get there. So I'm just doing a little bit of the Payne's gray over this brown, which is gonna hopefully read more like black. I'm trying to be very loose and light-handed with it. Okay. We did it! Boop, 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 boop. And now I'm looking at this lighter yellow and I was like, oh, I should have done my shading for that as well. So just rewind time or I can do it right now or attempt to do it right now. We'll see. We'll see how well this works. You'll know how I feel about this blue. I'm a little afraid of this blue. I'm more than a little afraid. Of I'm pretty afraid. I am fairly afraid of this, of this ultramarine. I have a, a fear. I'm afraid of it. I don't want to do too, too much because I don't want to lose the color, I think. This is actually a good dilution. It's going to dry a little lighter. We can always kind of tighten it up after. 
I want it to be kind of light handed too. We'll see how well I do with that. You guys know I have a problem with that. It's difficult for me. But practice takes, like to, to develop perfection, you need to do some practice. So I almost said practice takes perfect, which is not, not the correct order of operations. Oh, I was putting my hands like right on those V's. Did I transfer some of that color? Oh, I bet I did. Oh, you know it. Oh, wow. Otherwise, it's a decent color for yellow on her dress. It's not overly blue. I could have gone with a very light Payne's gray as well. Let that dry and then I think I'm going to do yellow on the inside of the flower. So it's going to be a blue and yellow flower which is going to be very contrasting. So I'll paint the inside first and give it a chance to dry. All right, so I think I'm gonna do another layer on her dress and then I may end up calling it an evening, giving my eyes a chance to reset so that I can make nice decisions, good decisions tomorrow. I'm pretty pleased with how this is turning out so far. So I don't really mind taking my time and there's no huge rush to get it finished other than leaving for Japan soon and want to have it done. So I'd like to have it done by Sunday, but I've got, it's Thursday evening now. So I've got enough time. Oh, kind of got over the border there. So something to keep in mind with sort of, um, I don't want to see it's like, this is a cold press. It's not a rough press, but it's got a bit more texture than a lot of watercolor papers and a lot of papers people are used to. And the same thing goes for Kilimanjaro, is that these soft squirrel brushes are very prone to getting kind of just dragged along whichever way the paper fiber is going, which if you're not careful, can kind of cause your brush to go places you didn't intend for it to go. So taking it slow, taking it kind of easy, helps you kind of maintain, or helps me kind of maintain control. I may switch to something a little stiffer bristled like a sable. These squirrels are great for like doing glazes and stuff because they won't disrupt prior layers, but they can be a little bit of a challenge to use for anything. For anything a little bit more, um, Wow, <laughs> I lost my train of thought, oh wow. It could be a challenge on kind of assertive papers, we'll call it assertive, it's a good word for this kind of paper. And I, I keep saying I do love these kind of papers. Um, I really love painting on nice cotton rag, using a little bit of the red for her blush. I don't mind that it's got a texture. In fact, I like the texture. I'm just bringing this up because a lot of my painting friends actually prefer hot press. And that is because, or one of the reasons is because assertive textures can make it hard for them to do the kind of details they want to do. So I just bring it up in case you find that you fall into that category. My work is obviously a little more cartoony, so in that regard, I'm not necessarily like really getting tight in there and pulling super small details. All right, so this has had time to dry overnight. I have a number of things that I need to swatch before I can actually start applying them. So you want to mix up that skin tone again, which looks very dark. Grab, ooh, there's even some green in there now, wow. <laughs> it's a little scary. Maybe I shouldn't have let it dry overnight. Swatch it over here. Yeah, look, it's a lot darker. 
hopefully not like scary darker. And now we need to swatch our brown that we mixed. Here is last night's. Here is our brown. I'm rinsing the brush out in between in case. See, that was a little more stable. I'm a little worried about that skin tone, but I'm gonna use it because we will, we will be brave. And it has been recommended by me, and I know that several artists here on YouTube have even tested it, that I use distilled water. And considering how much just junk is in the Nashville water system, I probably should. Like how many minerals, how much chlorine, things that can kind of negatively impact how you paint. The problem is organization and storage. You know, where, where am I going to put a... First of all, I'd need the kind of distilled water in a spigot for me to even use it. And then secondly, I would need to put it somewhere where I would remember that I have it. So I'd have to reorganize my studio, which does need to happen. And it's not as bad, especially since I can blend it out as I thought it would be. I was really a little nervous, really, just clearly a little, a little nervous. So I started on her legs because it was like, well, if I screw up, that's something that's like, it's better than screwing up on the face, which is, which I've done before. But even I am capable of learning and changing, improving and growing. But once we're almost done, I think, with her face and her skin, I do need to figure out a shadow color. I think I am going to go with maybe like some Payne's gray mixed with a little bit of red just so that it's a little, a little warmer and kind of closer to purple. I actually don't know if we can mix up a good purple with these co the colors we have in this set, which would kind of make it the difference between like, this is a blending set like the, or a mixing set like the Daniel Smith Essential Six. And this is just like our favorite colors that we think you would enjoy sort of try and test set. All right. And then I want to do another layer on her yellow dress. And I don't actually want to paint any purple directly on her, but I may mix so we can see if I even could, if I wanted to do a purple with these specific colors. It's just really that, that ultramarine, that it just kind of behaves weirdly. Like it's a pretty color on its own. Um, it would be beautiful for sky. So it'll probably be really nice for like um, on the go kind of cityscape painting because I can easily mix grays, grays, blues, browns, the sort of stuff I would need to do city painting or urban sketching. And of course, I'll be finding out soon in Japan. Do, 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 do. Then I wanted to do, I think I finally decided I want to do red on her, with a little bead at her collar and on her ribbon. So I'm going to start light, just like I did with the shoes. So that bead is adjacent to wet area right now, so I'll have to come back for it. We'll start on the ribbon, we'll start kind of light. And then we'll come back for that bead in a second. All right, so the red for her bead. It is time, the yellow has dried. And I'll also, now I said I was gonna do a darker yellow for her sash, but I can even go with red for that. And that way, uh, ketchup and mustard dress at least looks like it all was designed together. Kara McDonald, your magical friend. Fun fact, Kara doesn't have a last name because she doesn't live in the village, so there isn't need for one. However, if she did live in the village, her last name would probably be Taylor because her mom is a seamstress. For Lilliputians, last names vary based on profession, so it helps you identify who does what. 
rather than who's related to who. It's pretty safe to assume that most people who grew up in a village are probably related to one another in some way. And usually the village elders would have an in-depth record of who is related to who. Kind of vital when you keep things local. And marrying someone you're closely related to in Lilliputian society is greatly frowned upon. It's just bad news. Don't do it. Add a little more blue shadow down there. Take advantage of some of Arch's beautiful wet into wet blending properties. So while I wait, thought I could blend that out. No. While I wait for this to dry, I'm going to go ahead and experiment with seeing if we even can mix up a decent purple. I have a feeling, given we have a cooler red and a warmer blue, we're going to end up with a muddy purple. But we will see. So I've got my swatcheroo sheet right here. I'm gonna try doing it on the paper. We'll start with the ultramarine blue. Which is looking cool as a fair number of cucumbers this morning. Then we'll just mix that red right on top. Now we'll try doing it the opposite direction. Put that red down. And then we'll mix that ultramarine right on top. Finally, we're gonna do two where we glaze it. So rather than wet into wet, we're gonna do wet over dry. So we've got ultramarine, we've got red, and we're gonna let those dry. Okay, so since that's kinda dry, not fully dry, dry enough, we're gonna Glaze our red over it, get a little bit of lift up, and then with the ultramarine, do the same thing. And just none of these seem to be a decent purple. Mix some blue, mix some red off to the side, get them nice and mixed up. So this is the blue and the red, it's like 50 50, I guess. So it's kind of this color purple. Right? Like, it's purple. It's a purple. I would actually use that more as like a shadow tint than as a purple, but it's a purple. All right, we're gonna take the plunge. We're gonna shade her skin. Not with that purple, although that purple was not the worst purple. It's also not the best purple. Now I'm a little afraid of the, of the, <laughs> of the paint's gray. I'm like, oh, I don't know about this. He's spoopy. Okay, so I've got a type of a shadow color kind of mixed up. And I'm gonna swatch that because I am afraid of all the things today. And they all look like black to y'all. I think that'll work if I can get it light enough. What do we do? We start on the legs. Because if we goof those up, it's less noticeable than the face. It's definitely a shadow color that looks a little dirty. Hopefully it will dry a little better. Or I guess I can do another layer of skin tone on top of it. Definitely a little scary. All right, I'm gonna let that dry. I think I'm gonna go in with another layer of skin tone. Also, grab some of the gray and mix it with some of that. Go ahead and use it in her hat a little bit. So it dries a little bit better than it goes down. 
I'm going to go into this leg and tighten it up just because it's looking really muddy. And I'd ra I think a clean line would look less like poor painting and more like what I actually intend for it to be. Still want to go in and do another layer of her skin tone. Not too dark, but definitely on like her legs and her arms where things are starting to get pretty lost. I also find that on such an assertive paper, a Kalinsky brush as small as this Reserva I'm using, which it might actually be a Kalinsky squirrel mix, is just not strong enough to kind of hold its own and it kind of just goes whatever way the paper wants it to go. So maybe a small synthetic or just a stiffer brush that doesn't have as long bristles. The long bristles can be really nice because you get really fluid lines, but they can be a little harder to control. Just want to kind of make sure everything sort of matches up. I'm going to use a little bit of the Payne's Gray on her dress. Oh, that's going to be too dark. I may also use it as an undercolor on the red, just because that blue isn't exactly the easiest color to work with. I'm going to use some paper towels and pick up some of that extra gray, because that's a lot of gray. That's like Bowie, the cat levels of gray, and we don't need all that. And then I picked it all up. That wasn't my intention, but we'll roll. Let all of that dry, and then we'll see what we end up with. Do kind of a core painting of the shade in the ribbon there. Should have done it with her red shoes earlier. Do that now. And just paint another layer of red on top of them. Get the color a little bit better. And while that's drying, go ahead and add some depth to the branch that she's sitting on. Finally getting the paint. Oh, it's that separated away from the block over here. I wonder why that happened. I can't think of anything that I've done. That would have been so intense that that would have been expected. But I also haven't had too many opportunities to paint with arches on a block. And when I've had, I've usually had the opposite problem where I can't even remove it. So while we're waiting for this to dry, I'm going to go ahead and try to mix up Kara's hair color, which is going to be a challenge because not only do we have to get a blue, a red, sorry. We have to get, or rather a brown. Wow, words today. Not only do we have to get a brown, but we have to get a red brown. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna like pre-mix up here just to see if I can get in the general, actually with like a little more gray, I think that would be it. So that was actually a little easier. <laughs> a little easier than I thought it would be. I could actually leave it on here because I don't need too much of that color. Add a little water, add a little bowy. Lightly swatch it. Okay, that's too gray. Just like the cat. Add a little orange. Adds a little better. Add a little red. Because I'm going kind of for a Venetian red, which I usually use as a convenience color. I think this will work. I can, oh, why did I do it? <laughs> I can also um, start with a base of orange and then kind of paint on top of that. It's a very orangey orange though. Oh, too much red, actually. See, that's really more the color I wanted. Okay. Turn around. 
in that way. You're not, hopefully not dealing with the wet part of the paper. Again, as carefully as I can. I see that and then I can goof die a little bit. Leave a little rim lighting. And I do actually still want to come back in and darken up the skin in some areas. But you know what? Maybe this is like a good sign that I should not. Because then I have, you guys know, you guys know I have a tendency to overwork things. And right now things are okay. They're not perfect, but they're okay. Okay, so it's a little redder than I'd really want it, but we will deal, we'll be all right. Go into that skin tone, gotta mix it every time. Pick some up, work very carefully so as not to disturb the drying, the sleeping bebe, the drying watercolor. Not a fan of how muddy those legs are looking, but whatever. It's one of those, are you doing your best? Yes, well, that's all you can do then. Sometimes things happen. Sometimes you do your best and things don't always come together. It does look a little more purple around her face, which I'm happy about because that's a more appropriate color. So I'm gonna let this dry and then I'm gonna think about going into the face. Okay, so this has had a bit of a chance to dry. I'm gonna go in and hopefully not ruin the face. The face is good so far and you guys know I gotta like, I always gotta like mess with it. But I'm gonna try to be really light-handed about how I, I mess with it. Gonna blend that out in a second. Okay, all right, can I leave that alone now? A little afraid of it, it's like a snake, the overworked snake. And I know I'm off camera, I gotta clean the mat off, but I have to wait until I finish doing her hair to do that. So I'm working on her shoes a little bit. And now I'm working on the bow in her hair. And you guys can kind of see how that little core reflects the shading. Sometimes it's just all about knowing how to work with what you got. Go in very lightly and do another layer of lip and cheek blush because that seemed to get kind of lost when I did that other layer of shading. And I'll do that on her knees on her fingers, and I need to do it underneath her neck as well. So, for her dress, I actually wanna do maybe another layer, this time with a little bit of that orange, just to make it a little darker without uh, changing the color too much. So, we ended up mixing the Chinese orange with the yellow, we ended up with like well, you guys can't see it, but it's kind of a nice buttery yellow that now you guys can see. I think it'll kind of counteract how green the dress is starting to look. And my ketchup and mayonnaise dress isn't so bad. To be honest, I just love red ribbons, red shoes. I think they're really cute. And I thought a yellow dress would just be very early spring, which is what it finally is here in Nashville, and it's actually kind of nice. And I was so ready for it. I have a little bit of cleaning up to do over there. Water it down a little bit, and bring it out into sort of the main 
event, the main body of the dress. And even introduce a little bit up here. Okay, let's get that hair going. Try doing this with a small detailing brush. Using the same brown I mixed up earlier. I may end up having to go darker. And if you're disappointed that I'm not commenting too much on the paper, I'm sorry, it is good paper. And I don't necessarily have a lot to say about good papers other than, oh, they're so good. I'll try to do a blog post that kind of explains why it is a good paper though, since I'm having trouble doing that on camera. All right, so I'm gonna want a darker color. So what that means is I'm gonna have to add more Payne's Gray or blue. And I'm gonna do the Payne's Gray because I can kind of trust it a little bit more than I feel like I can trust the blue. I'm go ahead and Hello, lady, ladybug. Swatch it. I guess that will work. Lay that there. Get all up in that red. And grab a little bit of blue. It's hard to build a darker red with the colors we have. It's usually why when you see mixing sets, they have a warm red, a cool red, a warm blue, a cool blue, a warm yellow, a cool yellow. And I did it correctly this time. I had to be careful there because I always, always end up saying it wrong. And they do that because when you mix a warm red and a cool blue, it desaturates and you end up with kind of a neutral tone purple, which can be really useful. Like if that's what you're, you're after, if that's what you're looking for, that can be great. But if you're looking for like nice color vibrancy, your piece is going to get muddy fast because mixing cross complements is just not, or mixing cross temperatures is not really the best way to get the blends you probably want. Like, like these greens are kind of desaturated greens because we have a warmish yellow or a coolish yellow and a warmish blue. And if we wanted like really nice sort of tropical greens, we would mix a cool blue with a cool yellow. And I know some people have a hard time differentiating between explaining and complaining. And I know I do both a lot. So, so I'm just gonna point out that I'm just pointing this out so that people can understand some of the difficulties I'm having and can also mix some of the colors they're looking for if they're watching this as a sort of a mixing primer. It's not even a statement on the quality of the paints because the paints themselves are really beautiful. And the ultramarine, as much as I'm struggling with it for this purpose, the ultramarine is a really nice ultramarine. And it's got good depth of color and it reactivates decently from the pan, which is usually a challenge for ultramarines. And the yellow is like a really nice medium kind of yellow. So I'm probably gonna end up adding it to my usual watercolor palette. Add a little bit of this yellow gold here into the bee where I've been neglecting. A little bit up here into the flower. So I guess my point is you can have really nice paints and the wrong combination, or even just the wrong combination for what you're trying to paint, can make them much more difficult for you to utilize. Now I also know Kabocha sent me this set to play around with while I was in Japan. So what I did is I put some dots into a little travel tin that I can actually bring with me. So I'm hoping to get some really nice urban sketching done, which is kind of where I think these colors will shine a little bit better. All right, and let that dry as well. All 
right, so this has had a chance to dry. I'm gonna go in with that hopefully darker brown. I need to mix the brown on the log darker as well. Something I kind of struggle with with some of the nicer papers, just any paper, even with nicer brushes, but it's more prevalent with uh, synthetics is that my brush just wants to dump like all the paint in one spot on the paper. It's like, no, don't do that. Why? Why you do that? Why? Why? It does it when the paint is viscous. It does it when the paint is thin. Why you do that? Oh, I, oh, I over covered there. Oh, well. Okay. All right. I'm coming along. We're getting there. Grab a little bit of ultramarine. Do the shadow in the hat right there. A little bit of Payne's gray and ultramarine. Reinforce some of the shadows down here. Okay, not super happy with that flower up there. It's a little, little too saturated, so I'm gonna try lifting. Some watercolor papers are great for lifting. Some are just terrible for it. And some, whether you want it to or not, it's just gonna lift straight off some of the cheaper papers. It can be hard to do glazing and layers because of that. So, adding a little bit of water, scrubbing around just a smidge. We'll see what we get. And then I'm gonna go into the first layer that we did for her hair and we use this as the color for her freckles and I will. And it may not be dark enough. It may be kind of orange. We may have to go back with the darker brown. We'll see, we'll find out together. We'll explore. She's got freckles on her arms, so I'll do that. All right, we'll see how those dry. All right, I think, I think, other than doing a layer of freckles with the slightly darker brown, I think I can actually clean up the brown and start working on some of the things that require me to rotate the canvas a bit. So I'll quickly get in here, do my second layer of freckles as delicately as I can. And I don't do them all over, just here and there. That way you've got like kind of faded out freckles and you've also got kind of darker, newer, I guess, or more, more sun-kissed freckles. So use this as an opportunity to go in and it darkens some things up on our little bee buds. And they're looking pretty cute. So go into our baby's breath, because that's what that's supposed to be, is baby's breath. Okay, now tighten that a bit. And as well as our red ribbon, glaze over that so that we get a little bit more of the red. And then I think we're gonna go into the ultramarine and mix up her purple and really designate the shadow here, which kind of makes it blend back into her hair, but we'll figure that out in a little bit. Finally, at the nitpicking stage. You guys know my favorite stage. The best stage. Okay. Wanna get a good look at my buzzy reference. Busy buzzy, a buzzy body. up being a little bit more than I had wanted. Blend and lighten, blend and lighten, and lift a little bit. All right, so I have two things I wanna accomplish before we're done. I want to darken some areas on the log and I'm gonna do that by mixing Payne's Gray with the dark brown we mixed for Kara's hair and a little bit of the original brown we mixed 
for the branch. I'm mostly just using this so that I can kind of paint in the shadows. Okay, I'm gonna let this dry and clean up my work area a little bit. All right, guys, I think we're in the final stretch, at least the final stretch of adding details with paint. Of course, I'm probably gonna use a little bit of white gouache just to add details here and there. Bring some life to her eyes because right now they're just kind of two soulless orbs. So I'm adding a little yellow back into our dress base color. And I'm gonna paint a gingham ribbon. So, the first thing I'm gonna do, because I do actually want the layered color effect, is I am going to do the long horizontal lines, which are a challenge for me. So I'm gonna use the lines I've already drawn as a baseline and then subdivide that. And hopefully I can do a good job with, with my lines. All right, time for a little subdivision while also trying to follow the contours of the fabric. This is always a challenge for me to do well. And then we have just one more long line of horizontal to worry about right now. Long line of horizontal. We're getting it painted now. All right, so that's our base. I'm gonna let this dry because I do want the cross where the, the, the two layers cross to be a little darker, like real gingham. So give this a couple minutes to dry. All right, so that has dried. Now I can do my second layer. And this one is gonna hopefully be easier because all I'm really doing is I'm just drawing cross lines. So I'll start over here and just make sure to keep it perpendicular to my original set of lines while also following the curve of the fabric. And sometimes that level of attention is a little hard for me. So you're gonna go ahead and paint those stitches that are kind of holding the ribbon in place. All right, we got it. We did it. So I'm going to let that dry. And then I'll add my final details using bleed proof white. Okay, so I am adding in white details using bleed proof white. I did not realize my camera had, was turned off, so that's awesome. So I'm gonna try and kind of summarize what I was saying. I, was ta I am talking about the quality of these paints and that I don't think as a mixing set it's the most successful mixing set because I did have some difficulty getting colors that I wanted and I found that ultramarine blue to be really a sticky wicket. If they'd included a cool blue, I think there is more I could have done with it. Um, but they included a mid red and a mid yellow, a warm orange, a warm blue, and then a very gray Payne's gray, actually. I've never seen a Payne's gray that had that little blue in it, but was still very desaturated and cold, which made it a challenge to get some of the pure blends I wanted, some of the not muddy blends I wanted. Like you guys saw me demonstrating mixing purples and that was a bit of a challenge. I couldn't get a nice clean purple out of it. I do really like the Chinese orange they included, and I actually really like the sort of middle of the road yellow. Um, that's probably going to end up in my daily watercolor rotation because I'm always looking for good yellows and often tending towards warm yellows. 
so that's a good yellow for my pages but I and I even did like the ultramarine blue like all the quality of all the paints is great these are high quality really nice artist paints I just struggled to use it as a standalone mixing set um, and I'm going to be bringing the smaller pocket set with me to Tokyo and well to Japan as a whole and I'm going to try to do some urban sketching with it so I'll be able to provide a little more feedback on how I feel about the set as a whole later on. So if my thoughts change, if I come back and I'm like, I really loved it for urban sketching and here are my sketches, then you guys will hear about it. Um, but as a testing set, just to get a feel for some of their best colors, I think it's a great choice and I like the colors they picked. The Payne's Gray is kind of hit or miss, but like all the other colors are great colors. The red is really nice. It's a nice middle of the road red. Um, not too cool, not too hot. So there's a lot of use for it. The Chinese orange is just a really nice brown orange. I love brown oranges like that. And it's shade, so there's a lot of variation in the color. Uh, the ultramarine blue works well, even out of the half pan, which is really unusual in my experience with ultramarine blues. Usually they, they lose a lot of their impact. The yellow is really nice, not too cool, not too hot. So it's a very versatile yellow. I even think the red and yellow as mixing colors for a mixing set are, are really solid. It's the blue that I had difficulty with because it is such a warm blue that unless I was mixing it with like an alizarin crimson or an opera rose or something, it ends up, the color ends up kind of muddy, like regardless. And it felt like I was just always kind of fighting with, with those kind of blends. And I, was really concerned, as you guys will remember, about the skin tone. I just, I was really concerned that colors were just gonna drop out on me, shifting the color entirely, especially because I had to step away overnight. And it took a lot of mixing to figure out a skin tone as well. And part of that is, um, you know, I'm just not necessarily used to those sort of, That's sort of a blending set. That's sort of a color selection in a blending set. I'm more familiar with the two reds, two yellows, two blues. And it's the blues that really throw me. And I think it's because I paint a lot of, obviously a lot of foliage. Um, and I don't think there is any one limited color blending set that is perfect for everyone, that's why pocket sketch sets usually have 12 colors. So you can also get some of the, the, uh, there's like a hair in there and it's affecting my color. Oh, it's gonna ruin that. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's such a fine hair. I can't do anything about it. And it, I'll have to recolor that. I'll just wait till it dries. But, um, Blending sets in general, you know, it's it's difficult to have a limited palette that can work for everyone unless you're going with like a monochrome palette or something really unusual. And I'm kind of a big fan, in fact, of like trying to find the smallest number of paints I can reasonably bring. And I think that number might be with the Daniel Smith Essential Six set. And last year, Kabocha sent me that set. So you guys can check out that review by clicking these cards. So it's really cool to be able to kind of bookend with another mixing set from Kabocha. So, you know, it's really, it's really satisfying to be able to, to kind of test and see. So I'm gonna let this area that I just fixed dry and we'll see how it looks dry. Now I'm a little nervous about it, trying to fix that hair. So this blue over here, it doesn't look like the worst, but you know, I never can leave good well enough alone. I just can't. So I'm gonna glaze over it, which I think will actually make it fit in a little bit better. I don't even have a problem with the intensity of it. I just want it to not look like it replaced the yellow there. And then also, you know, go in with just a little bit of Payne's Gray and add some shadows on her face. 
rather than lighting the shadows on her face. We're gonna add some shadows to her face. And then I think we're done. I think we're really done. I think we are done painting, y'all. We're finished painting here. All right, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. I do it again in a heartbeat. Uh, but I, I do think I'm done. So, as I was painting, I've been pretty careful when I move this not to, you know, just whatever. And it's already started to come up from there and at the bottom. I've never had an arch. I've only had like two arches pads, but I've never had an arches pad where that's happened before. Usually I have a heck of a time getting the paper off the pad and have even cut myself doing that. So uh, I don't know if it's like for sheet blues, because sometimes that's a thing or what, but it is causing a little bit of warp and a little buckling there. So I'm gonna let this dry and then together we're gonna remove it from the block. All right, I think this is all dry, fully dry. So I think if I can dry my own hands off, I just wash them in the sink, we can literally just very easily remove it from the block. This is literally, literally, the easiest arches removal I've ever enjoyed. Usually it involves an exacto blade and much finagling. So this was a true pleasure. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. I hope this answered some questions for you. And thank you so much Kabocha for the early birthday present. Uh, not only did I enjoy playing with these paints and I will enjoy playing with these paints, but I enjoyed recording this video to share with you guys. So I hope you guys have a great day and I hope to see you again really soon. And before you go, if you could do me one favor, if you could head on over to inkdropcafe.com and check out our wonderful webcomic collective and phenomenal, fantastic artist resources, that would really make my day. That would be a great little simple birthday present that you could give me. So hopefully I'll see you guys again really soon and I hope you guys have a great day. Bye.